The Bell Telephone System brings you another of its series of programs on science. Man's effort to understand nature's laws. Of a home. Jim, but come on now, let's get cracking with this. Look, you know, this is the film for my science screen. Take care of it and keep it in focus, will yes, you? Okay, Doc, Doc. But All right, guys, let's get set for a rehearsal. Yes, Everything works what? this time, boys. Science screen, magic screen, music, effects. My magic screen film all set up, Jim? Well, the screen is ready. <laughs> and so is the imagination. Now, get lost. Fiction and science. That's a pretty good team. Say, what's the big show about today? Hemo the Magnificent. Humo? Hemo. That's Greek for blood. Oh, blood. Blood? Ooh, well, don't get any on you. <laughs> Doc, I think we're just about all set. Now, we'll open the show on the magic screen. Wait till you see what I've got dreamed up. Come on, magic screen. on the cheek, the spring of the land. I am the precious sacrifice ancient man offered up to his gods. I am the sacred wine in the silver chalice. Down through the ages, I am the price men pay for freedom. But to you scientists, I'm a smear on a slide, a stain, a specimen, a sickness. My story is a song only poets should sing. Not disease lovers. Come on, gang! Oh, yeah, come on, let's go. Now, just a gosh darn minute, you, you chemo hot stuff. Mm. Men like Dr. Research don't study disease because they love it. Tens of thousands of doctors and scientists, nurses, technicians work night and day to create health. Yeah, they've saved millions of lives, mending bodies, relieving pain, fighting disease, not by witchcraft and instinct or, or poetry but by experiment and observation. Knowledge about you picked up piece by piece the hard way with their smears and their stains and their microscope. You, you drip. <laughs> well, bless his little blood pressure. The writer man made a speech. <laughs> <laughs> what am I doing throwing my top to a cartoon? You invented him. Well, I, I goofed. All right, back to the woods, comics. We need you like a bloody nose. One moment, boy. What's the purpose in telling my story? Well, Mr. Hemo, the spirit of man seeks truth through many avenues. The artist seeks it through creative expression, through beauty, music, form, the laws of harmony. The religious through spiritual revelation, through the power of prayer, love, mercy, moral laws. 
And in science, we seek it through the study of nature and its physical laws. Yeah. And to us, it's as fascinating as any poetry. Hmm. I may listen. Roll one. If I can stay awake. Man's fascination with you, Mr. Hemo, goes way, way back into our dim past. Probably back to prehistoric times, when man discovered he could defend himself better with a club than with his hands. <laughs> Or that he could kill certain foods he couldn't catch on foot by throwing rocks. That's man, all right. Yeah, yeah, yeah. man. Death, food, and blood. The primitive imagination began to stir. Blood was life. Some early genius even discovered that blood would make his sick vegetables lush and green again, not knowing it was a fine natural fertilizer. No wonder ancient medicine men attributed magical powers to blood and cooked up weird mixtures of it for curing the sick. Matter of fact, as recently as Shakespeare's time, blood and its circulation continued to be a, a dark and fearful mystery. Then came the first great light. That light was William Harvey, 1628. This English pioneer of the scientific method, using only his eyes, observed and proved everything about circulation, except the tiny capillaries, which are too small to see without a microscope, although he did predict their presence. Your circulation, Mr. Hemo, is now completely observed and proven. This chart will help explain it. Behold man, the great brain. It took him some 50,000 years to discover he had a circulation. <laughs> and it'll take him another 50,000 years to explain it with that crazy mixed-up chart of some moron's innards. Hey, uh, who's the guy full of red spaghetti? <laughs> Must have swore the inside of a television set. <laughs> <laughs> you laugh, eh? I'm funny charm. Hang on wall, no name, no soul, eh? Stupid people. I have name, I have soul. The great professor anatomy. You listen to Hebo, eh? Poet yet. <laughs> no, well. Without my delicate machinery of circulation I build for you, you are just fertilizer. Oh, yes. You're the plumber. <laughs> Back on the wall, mechanic. What good is your plumbing without my richness flowing through it? Now, wait a minute, wait a minute. I like Professor Anatomy. Plumbing, I might understand. Yes, you might. It's beautiful. It's simple. Science makes a big deal from it. Look, two bulbs, rubber, like garage men feed battery with. I fill with red stuff, blood maybe, it's not important. I glue together, side by each. Now, I take tube from right one, make big loop and stick in left bulb, so. Same way, left tube into right bulb, so. Everything full of liquid, understand? Now, two little muscle men, one on each bulb. And we are ready to circulate. Little muscles, push. What's the matter? Push! Something's wrong. Nothing goes wrong. <laughs> That's right. But Professor got imagination. Mm. Watch. Here at the front door, I put in little reception room. One here, one here. Between reception room and main living room, I put one-way doors. Should only in open. Where you go out from living room, I put another one-way door. Must only out open. You come in front door, reception room, living room, and out. Can't come in back door. Everything one way, see? Same way, other living room. Is duplex house. Yes? He's genius, no? <laughs> Two smaller muscle men to push on reception rooms. And? Ready, muscles? Roger. Like prize fight. One, two. Push! Goes round now. No? This pump is the house. See the little doors work? 
the valves of the heart. Reception rooms fill up, while living rooms pump out. It's simple, yes? It's simple, yes. But what about the lungs, the veins, the... Oh, details. You want lungs? Okay. Oh! Little balloon, see? Now I put balloon inside another bulb, so is long. And I cut top loop and put in long, so. Now long is not push him out machine, is suck him in machine. So we put two pulling muscle men on the long, and the nose up here. Now muscles, pull. See? That is long, a one balloon long. You got millions of balloons in your lungs, little air sacs. But one air sac, billion air sacs, works all the same. Oh! Now listen to my genius. I make this little balloon so thin, gas can pass right through it. But liquid, no. Isn't that something? So now we bring the blood, uh, pardon the expression, inside long, make it flow around little balloon and go out. Now, slow motion, inhale. What happens? Oxygen comes in balloon, passes through my thin wall into the blood, making it bright red. The blood coming to the lungs is dark because it's weak in oxygen. Instead, it's full of waste gas, carbon dioxide, which passes through my thin wall into the balloon. Exhale. CO2 goes up flu and out exhaust pipe, the nose. Now, without stopping, inhale. Exhale. Isn't that sensational? But this is just lung circulation. Oh. Down here is body circulation. So we cut and put in body. What is body? Is motor, living engine. Man, woman, cat, fish, any animal is motor. What is making motor run? Air, fuel. Air is coming from lungs already. Fuel <laughs> is simple. You eat. Food has carbon, fuel, like coal. But food is needing refining, digesting. So for digesting is stomach. For refining into high octane and storing is liver. So now oxygen from lungs, carbon from liver is going into motor here and is burned into carbon dioxide, ashes and energy. Energy body is using for working, thinking, playing gin rummy. Carbon dioxide Blood is taken to the lungs and out exhaust pipe, the nose. The ashes? Ah! Oh. <laughs> My beautiful garbage disposal, the kidney! Only five ounces this jewel. But it cleans out all the ashes, garbage and trash from the blood. For this, I should two Nobel Prizes get. I do Oops! <laughs> Excuse it, please, doctor. Get back in the chart, Professor. Y yes, Doctor. Coal, motors, ash cans. He drives us crazy around here. So, that's science. Isn't that sensational? Let's go, fellas. Yeah, yeah go. I really goofed with you guys. Well, I like the part about the funny heart, though. Mr. Turtle, have you ever seen your heart? Me? No. <laughs> well, I ain't never even seen my tail. Roll six. What are you doing, Doc? Let him go, huh? It's all right now. Watch. Mr. Turtle, here's your heart. Oh, doggone. <laughs> Look at it go. Come on. This is good Look at that one. Yeah. And here's Mr. Rabbit's heart. Here's Mr. Bird's heart. Hey! 
Hey, mine goes faster than the others. <laughs> That's because you're small, Mr. Bird. Small animals lose heat faster than large ones, so their blood must circulate faster to keep their bodies warm. Now, in small birds, their hearts beat about 600 times per minute. Cats, 130. Man, about 75. And a big old elephant's heart, only 25 a minute. Hey, Doc, uh, you got a human heart? Has he got a human heart? Wait till you see this. Roll 10. Physiologists have photographed it, analyzed it, taken it apart, piece by piece, and it's still a mystery to us. Here's a human heart, one of nature's masterpieces. This tireless organ the poets sing about, this seat of love and compassion, weighs only about three-fourths of a pound. But the work it turns out is almost incredible. How long would you say that it takes your heart to pump a quart of blood? Just standing around like this. A quart? Oh, a couple of minutes, I guess. You're way off. Normally, the heart will pump a quart of blood in just about 10 seconds. In 10 minutes, it would fill the gas tank of your car, and in 10 hours, it would fill a gas truck. In just 10 days, it could fill the average home swimming pool. And in 10 years, in 10 years, this living pump, only as big as your fist, would completely fill two ocean-going oil tankers. Holy smoke. I don't believe it. Neither do I. It's astonishing, but true. Now watch this amazing little pump in slow motion. Your heart's the strongest and toughest muscle, about as big as your fist or your paw, and it weighs less, but it does as much work as all the other muscles put together, and it never gets tired. Well, uh, what makes it work anyway? You mean the heart? What makes it beat in the first place? Well, we don't really know, do we, Doc? No, we don't know. We can't consciously make it stop or start. But we know something about what makes it go faster or slower. Remember Professor Anatomy's heart with the four rooms and the four little muscles? This muscle man that works the right oracle is the boss man. Through nerves like telephone wires, he's connected directly to the head man in the lower brain. And in turn, he controls the other three muscles with telephone lines of his own. He sets the pace. That's why we call one, him the pacemaker. One, two, one, two, one, two, one, two, one, two. One wire, the sympathetic nerve, it's called, carries faster, the go-faster faster, 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 signal. Faster, 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 it's been referred to faster, as the whip or the giddy-up nerve. And the other, the vagus nerve, is the slower, reins or, slower, whoa, slower, slow down slower, wire. Slower, slower, Emotional slower. excitement, like watching a prize fight, or having an argument, or falling in love stimulates the giddy-up nerve. Faster, the pacemaker faster, speeds up the heartbeat. Faster, 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 faster. On the other hand, rest or sleep brings the whoa, slow down slower, vagus nerve slower, into action. Slower, 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 slower. A lie detector is based in part on changes in the heart rate due to emotional stresses under questioning. Hey, would you look at that? And another most important automatic control of the heart rate is for the protection of our brain. Oh, wait till you get this. This will really be news to you. The brain cells have priority over everything else when it comes to blood supply. If pressure to the brain is too high, it might rupture small blood vessels, damaging or killing some of the brain cells, which could result in a stroke. And if the pressure is too low, the brain isn't getting enough food and oxygen. Fainting occurs. To maintain a constant blood pressure to the brain, there's a beautiful little device called a barostat, which controls pressure just as a thermostat controls heat. If pressure increases, it sends a message to the reflex center in the brain. Pressure going up. Roger. Slow down, pacemaker. You want to kill us? Nuts. Relax, fellas. Dupe. One, two. One, two. One, two. Pressure too low. Speed up. You want to starve us? Make up your mind. Pick it up, fellas. One, two, one, two, one, two. Actually, this li Let me show you. Come over here and lie down, will you? Oh, yeah. Uh, actually, this little pressure governor in our necks, 
right here, one on either side. This little pressure, Governor, for the discovery of which Dr. Cornet Hymans of Belgium received the Nobel Prize. This little governor keeps us from fainting when we suddenly stand up from a sitting or lying down position. Now, as we stand up, gravity pulls the blood downward into our legs, reduces the blood pressure in the brain. But the barostat instantly increases the heart rate to help build pressure back up to normal. You mean just standing up on my hind legs makes my heart go faster? Yeah, for a few seconds it does. I don't believe it. Squat. Stand up. He's right. It does go faster. What did I tell you? Yeah, but my heart beats fast sometimes when I don't move. Like when I hide from a lion. Well, that's different. That's caused mainly by another kind of message to the heart. A hormone. A oh, what? what? Well, a, a hormone. It's produced by the adrenal gland, a sort of chemical messenger that travels in the blood. Uh, this may give you an idea. Uh, roll 13. Light waves flash lion to the deer's eyes. The eyes flash lion electrochemically to the brain. And the brain sounds the red alert. General quarters, lion! Down a nerve goes the mobilization order to the adrenal gland. The adrenal gland shoots out a chemical messenger into the bloodstream, and he takes the message to the heart. Get going! Lion! Oh, drop dead. Relax, fellas. A lion. A lion! Get going! One, two, one, two, one, two, one, two! We've got a lot of little messengers like that running around in us, haven't we, Doc? Oh, yes. Chemical regulators, we call them. When we experience fear, anger, worry, disease, any kind of stress. You left me with a lion! Saw so you hiding, huh? No, yeah, but I thought he'd hear my heart pounding. Yeah, mine too. I think I've swallowed a drum sometimes. So what makes that boom boom sound, Doc? Well, that's the heart sounds. We call them lub dub. Jim, roll a lub dub reel, will you? The lub is vibration caused by the contracting ventricles and the slamming of the front doors. These valves here. Now, the second sound, the dub, is the sound made by the closing of these two valves. The slamming shut of the two back doors, as Professor Anatomy might say. And here's how these valves work in a real heart, as photographed by Dr. Carl Klassen of Ohio State University. Lub dub. Lub dub. The beat of life. The oldest rhythm. It beats in babes before they're born. It beats in eggs before they're hatched. In creatures huge or microscopic, nature beats creation's rhythm. Mystery and the wonder of life. It beats in hearts completely removed from the body. It even beats in pieces of this never-say-die muscle. Such is the courage and integrity of your heart. Gee, hearts has got guts, ain't they? Hmm. Sure have. I got two of them. Two hearts? I can feel another one right here in my foot. No, no, that's your pulse, Ninny. My what? Your pulse, the, you know, the thing they take when you... Well, you tell them, Doc. What you feel is your blood spurting through your artery. Uh-oh, more plumbing. Let's go. Oh, no, Hemo. This is fun. Oh, I'm learning something. Hey, poet, you losing your fans? What's an artery, Doc? You see from the heart, the blood is pumped to every inch of the body through strong elastic tubes we call arteries, sending traveling waves of surging blood through them, which we feel as pulse. Now, here's the main artery, the aorta, it's called big one-inch freeway through which all the blood leaves the left side of the heart under high pressure. As almost everybody knows, the aorta branches out into smaller freeways, first to the heart itself, and the brain, arms, stomach, down to the legs and so forth. And these freeways branch out into hundreds of miles of smaller one-way streets and alleys until they get so tiny you can't see them with the naked eye. The blood starts fast at the heart, and slows way down at the end of the microscopic arteries. 
Beyond this dividing line, the tiny arteries become tiny veins, which are much thinner and less muscular because of much lower pressures. Almost a mirror image of the arterial flow away from the heart. Now the important news about veins is the one-way valves inside them, which allow blood to flow toward the heart, but snap shut and stop any flow away from the heart. Now when we lie down, there's enough pressure left at the end of the arteries to push the blood back to the heart through the veins. But when we stand upright, the veins in the lower part of the body need outside help to push the blood uphill. And since the veins are very thin, every time we move a muscle, the contraction squeezes the veins near that muscle, and since the blood can only go one way because of the valves, the muscle squeezes it on up toward the heart. Isn't that something? Every time you move an arm or a leg or even make a face, you're squeezing veins and helping to get blood back to the heart. Isn't that it, Doc? That's right. That's, that's why you stretch after sleeping, to squeeze veins and get the circulation into high gear for daytime activities. That's why soldiers who stand at rigid attention for a long time often faint, keel over. Lack of muscle movement causes blood to, to collect in their legs, cutting down the necessary supply to their brains. That's why it's less tiring to walk than it is to stand still. That's why your feet swell when you sit motionless for hours in a plane. That's also why people who spend a great deal of time on their feet sometimes have trouble with their leg veins. The constant weight of blood distends the leg veins so much the check valves pull apart and let the blood leak back down. Ever since I learned this, I make a point of sitting down and putting my feet up every chance I get. Hey, Doc, not to change the subject, but where does this magnificent hemo do most of his work? In the veins or in the arteries? He does no work at all in the veins or the arteries. Well, uh, where does he do it? Now, that's a good question. But before I can go into that, I'll have to tell you something about blood itself. Just a moment, brother scientist. So far, your chatter on plumbing has been uh, elementary but harmless. But now that you've come to me, I refuse to listen further unless you first describe me in just two words. I can. Never mind. Professor, mention the two key words, and I'll know you understand the poetry, the mystery, and the true meaning of blood. Otherwise, back to your plumbing. Hey, Doc, he's trapping us. Do you know what the two words are? Oh, you do? <laughs> The two words that best describe you and connect you with the mystical origins and traditions of life are seawater. Seawater? Quiet! Brother Research, my apologies. You mean he's right? Listen to this learned man and you'll hear a real tale. Seawater? Doctor, please tell them who I am. Well, thank you. It's only a theory, of course. This I gotta see. But if you squeeze the human body as you would a sponge, you'd squeeze out some 30% of the body weight as about six gallons of free water, which we shall call body fluid. This squeezed out body fluid has a salt content of 1%. Tropical sea animals might exist in this aquarium of body liquid. Now the salts in seawater are like the salts in body fluid, as you can see. Although seawater today is two or three times saltier than body fluid. Some biologists account for this difference by saying that body fluids today represent the less salty composition of seawater as it was nearly 400 million years ago, when life emerged from the sea and began to crawl on land. At any rate, a billion and a half or two billion years ago, Life is presumed to have originated in the warmth of tropical waters as a minute, single-celled aquatic organism, something akin to the tiny living single cell we know today as the amoeba. This shapeless, jelly-like primeval cell absorbed its food and oxygen directly from the sea and passed out its carbon dioxide and other wastes to the warm ocean. In the beginning, Hemo was the sea. Please. 
time crawled in those days, there's been life on this planet for at least a billion and a half years. Yet for hundreds of millions of those years, life is supposed to have existed as separate, one-celled, microscopic water animals. And then something wonderful happened. Obeying a great plan not given to us to know, groups of these cells came together to live as colonies. And new animals were born. But just as the early American colonials gathered in colonies behind stockades, yet each fed and clothed himself independently, so did the early colonial cells exist independently. They hadn't learned to specialize yet. And each cell in these primitive organisms had to have individual contact with its great provider, the sea. Consequently, no little sea animal could be more than two cells thick in any of its parts. And that stymied their growth for a long time. The hydra is one of those early cell groupings. It was Y-shaped, two cells thick, and had an opening or primitive mouth through which the seawater could flow in and out to bathe and feed the inner cells. That was the crude beginning of internal circulation. Just as the early colonials specialized for the good of the community, some becoming carpenters, blacksmiths, weavers, while others raised the food, so did the cells in primitive sea animals begin to specialize. Some, in telling others what to do, became the brain. Others, in building, and became bone. Those interested in feeding became stomachs. While still others organized themselves into a pump and a closed circulating system to bring the precious fluid to the cells that were too deeply embedded in the body to have direct contact with the sea. New organisms could now be more than two cells thick, and they grew fast. About 400 million years ago, the first fish took form, thousands of cells thick, with a simple circulation system which is still in fish today. A low-pressure, two-chambered heart with one ventricle, one auricle, and one slow circulation which pumps blood, a specialized form of seawater, up to the gills for oxygen, and directly to the body cells. And because their blood is cooled by outside water surrounding the gills, fish are cold-blooded. That is, their bodies have the same temperature as the water they swim in. When, for some reason known only to God, water animals first crawled out on land, they had to learn to breathe in air as well as in water. So, some of the internal cells organized themselves into a lung through which blood could extract oxygen from air. The lungfish is an early example. Yeah, but what about frogs? Amphibious animals like frogs, also cold-blooded, have a three-chambered heart and two circulations. One to the lungs, the other to the body. But the two circulations are both pumped from one ventricle at medium speed and pressure, since the blood doesn't have to regulate their temperature. But as soon as the heart became a four-chambered pump, two separate high-speed, high-pressure circulating systems became possible, and land animals could live entirely out of water at a constant warm temperature, regardless of their surroundings. But these land animals, whether they look like birds, or bears, or baboons, are still composed of billions of cells that have to be bathed, fed, serviced, or as the great French physiologist Claude Bernard put it, kept in a constant internal environment in the same way their ancient predecessor, the tiny one-celled amoeba, was bathed in seawater. Only now, land animals have to manufacture their own kind of seawater in the form of blood and other body fluids. Now, wait a minute, Doc, wait a minute. Are you trying to say that I'm descended from some kind of sea gnat? You have a human spirit that separates you entirely from the animal world. But there's great mystery and great wonder in the fact that our body, this temple of the spirit, is built of billions of highly specialized individual cells, like minute tropical sea animals that could only live in, well, say, Tahiti. Externally, your address may be in Ethiopia, Tibet, or Kansas City. But internally, we're all basking in the warm waters of the South Sea Isles. 
thanks to Hemo the Magnificent, whom the poet Goethe described as that entirely wonderful sap. Please. So you see, Mr. Hemo, bit by bit, we've come to know that your job is to play seawater to our body cells. Uh, excuse me. Hey, what's the matter, turtle boy? Hemo's big jaw. He don't do it in veins. He don't do it in the arteries. So where's he do it? <laughs> Out in left field? Brother Turtle, you're pretty sharp. Now I can see how you beat Mr. Rabbit in that famous foot race. Oh, <clears throat> well, it's just... <laughs> all right, but you pay close attention. Believe it or not, Mr. Hemo does all his great work in this thin line that separates the arteries from the veins, in the capillaries. Tiny little blood tubes, too small to see with the naked eye. You remember the little primitive sea animals were only two cells thick because each cell had to have contact with seawater? Well, our bodies are so crisscrossed with billions of capillaries that except in our bones and eyeballs, not one of our cells is more than two cells away from the nearest capillary. And just the tip of your little finger, you have thousands of capillaries. This illustration might help. Now here's the end of one of the billions of tiny arteries branching off into several capillaries which are surrounded by customers, the muscle cells. Passing slowly through, the blood services the customers, then collects in a tiny vein and hurries on back for a new load of food and oxygen. These capillaries are only about one-fiftieth of an inch long and so fine that red cells only one three-thousandth of an inch have to squeeze through in single file. A bundle of 50 capillaries is still finer than a human hair. The walls of the capillaries are only one cell thick, and it's through the chinks in this thin wall that Hemo serves his customers with food and oxygen, like a grocery man, and takes out the waste products like a garbage man. Now, a very important key figure in this whole goings-on is this little gatekeeper muscle here in the tiny artery that feeds each of the billions of capillaries. Most of the time he opens and closes according to the local needs of his alley of customers. If they need service, he opens up and lets Hemo come in to do his grocery man, garbage man act. Service over, he closes down again. In a muscle at rest, only about 1% of the capillaries are open at any one time. But in a very active muscle, they all open up. But Doc, doesn't Mr. Gatekeeper Muscle also take orders from the central government, from Mr. Big up here in the brain? Yes, sir. Through nerves, telephone lines. In case of an emergency or if blood is urgently needed elsewhere, we'll go. the brain orders Mr. Gatekeeper to stay closed. Dispatcher, close down sphincter X315J10. Oh, goody, boss. X315J10. Close your little capillary or else. And Mr. Gatekeeper stays closed. Shut up. Boss says no. No matter how loud his local customers yell for service. Yeah, but if you can't see the cap uh, caparelli, uh, how are you, uh, you going to know all this stuff? Ah, more magic. Roll 16. Now, Mr. Turtle, these are microscopic scenes of the actual blood flow in live bats, frogs, and hamsters, as taken by Drs. George P. Fulton and Brenton R. Lutz of Boston University, and by Drs. Paul A. Nickel and Richard L. Webb of Indiana University. To the sharpest naked eye, all this would be invisible. This is a minute, highly magnified artery branching into smaller arteries. The blood still travels pretty fast here, in a moment, you'll see it slow way down in the capillaries. Notice the pulsing flow as the heart pumps Mr. Hemo into billions of these ever-branching, ever-smaller microscopic arteries. Now we're down to the finest of arteries, where you can see the individual red cells, little flat concave discs. And branching off, is the tiniest of all blood vessels, the capillary. So thin, the blood cells have to go through in single file. 
Surrounding the capillary are the customers, the, the muscle cells which hemo services. After traveling through the capillary, now remember it's only about a 50th of an inch long, hemo collects in tiny veins, which join up into larger veins, which flow into still larger veins as hemo races back to the heart and lungs for a new load of food and oxygen. Now let's get back to the capillaries where the main show takes place. Here's where the magnificent hemo does his stuff. Everything else in the circulation system, heart, arteries, veins, are all designed for just one purpose, to take Mr. Hemo to and from his work in the capillaries. And here's a key actor in the show, the donut-shaped sphincter muscle, the gatekeeper that opens or closes the capillary on orders from his muscle customers or from the head man in the brain. Here's another gatekeeper. There are billions like him, probably the most important muscle in your body, yet you can't see him without a high-powered microscope. Now watch this one close down. Eh, service is over. This very choosy gatekeeper is letting the red cells in one at a time. Remember, these red cells are so tiny, a row of 3,000 of them laid flatwise would measure just one inch. Now watch how beautifully this character controls the number of red cells going into his capillary. Now over on the other end of the capillaries and the tiny veins, there's another gatekeeper valve that, well, it's still a big mystery to us. In dozens of research centers all over the world, scientists are burning the midnight oil trying to find out why, when, and what makes this strange little muscle open and close. Now, Mr. Turtle, what do you think of that? Gee, I wish I was a scientist. Yeah, Hemo, why don't you ever show us magic things like that? Hemo can't. He's a poet. Friends, you might as well know it. The magic of knowledge and reasoning is only for humans. Mr. Hemo, we only wish it were magic. Nobody's born with knowledge. It has to be acquired with hard work added to and passed on. Every doctor, every scientist, every nurse, student, technician that ever lived has enriched the future by adding his or her two cents worth to the common fund of human knowledge. Few of these people may win prizes, but the rest are rewarded with the greatest of all awards, personal satisfaction with their creative work. Are you saying science is an art? Sure, it's an art. Thoreau once defined art as that which improves the quality of the day. Well, what's improved our daily lives more than science, huh? What do you do around here? Well, me? Well, I, I try to make things easier, I guess. If you made things easier for me, you'd live longer. He's right. Roll 21. Let me show you how right he is. We have three main body activities, thinking, eating, and moving represented by the brain, stomach, and muscles. Each has its separate blood supply. Now, if all three functions were going full blast at the same time, all the capillaries in the body would be open. To fill them, we'd need 10 times as much blood and a heart 10 times as big to pump it around. But this would be a big waste because we don't think, eat, and run at the same time. Television writers do. Yes, but normal people have a wonderful mechanism that cuts down blood flow to parts of the body that are not going full blast, diverts it to the organs and muscles that are working. Now, as we've seen, at the end of each of the microscopic arteries, just ahead of the capillaries, there's a small muscle that acts as gatekeeper or flow controller. Each has his own private nerve line to the brain. And upon orders from the dispatcher in the brain, each of the billions of tiny gatekeepers huh? here represented by one only, will open or close his own particular valve. Now for the open position, which is normal, 
the gatekeeper muscle just relaxes. And when signaled to close down his capillary, the gatekeeper has to apply constant pressure or the valve will spring open. Now first, the brain. Whether we're thinking hard or just daydreaming, the brain valves are always open. No matter what the rest of the body is doing, these non-replaceable, non-repairable VIP governing cells must be constantly supplied with a rich flow of hemo or goodbye body. Mm -hmm. But if we're digesting a big meal, the digestive valves open wide and the muscle valves are ordered to close. Conversely, if we run, exercise, work hard, the muscle valves open and the digestive system is mostly closed. What about eat and run guys like me? What happens to us? Well, several things are all bad. The brain has top priority, but muscles have priority over digestion because muscles mean survival. You fight, you run with them. Suppose you've just finished a seven course dinner, the works. Your abdominal valves are wide open and about a quarter of your blood is racing through the digestive capillaries while the muscle gatekeepers get the red stay closed light. Yeah, but Doc, suppose I get up from a big meal and uh, I run or I go swimming or, or suppose my girl insists on doing a fast polka, what then? Well, have a good time because the brain dispatcher will do his duty even though he knows you're off your trolley. He orders the digestive gatekeepers to close down and the muscle gatekeepers to open up since they now have priority, leaving the stomach holding the bag with a big meal it can't digest, for which it complains bitterly by giving you indigestion. But if the girl's pretty, it's worth it. You mean they don't sleep after eating? What's indigestion? It means you're civilized. Doc, since we're all human, doesn't our brain dispatcher ever make mistakes in sending messages to the capillaries? Oh, yes. Just as a quarterback occasionally balls up signals. Do you watch boxing matches? Uh, oh, price fight, sure. <laughs> boxing matches. The next time you see a knockout, remember that it's balled up signals that are doing the knocking out. You're kidding. No. A boxer's blood is mostly flowing through his active muscles. Practically no blood in his stomach and intestines. Hard blow to the chin, slashes the jawbone back against the brain dispatch center, blitzing communications to the capillaries. Things happen fast. The closed signal to stomach gatekeepers goes dead. They relax. Unattended valves spring to normal, open position, and bingo. About a third of his blood just pours into millions of empty abdominal capillaries. The blood pressure takes such a sudden nosedive, the VIP brain cells pass out from lack of blood. The fighter loses consciousness, he drops like a log, and the referee starts counting. One! And the crowd goes mad. Two! If the brain dispatcher gets his wrecked communications straightened out before the count of ten, he frantically signals the abdominal gatekeepers to close down, close down. And the blood is quickly diverted back to the brain and muscles. But pressure goes up again. Brain cells come to... Oh, who hit me? The fighter staggers to his wobbly feet and has at it again. So that's what happens when the guy I bet on gets flattened. I always thought it was the same as shock. No, it isn't shock. This is knockout. Shock's different, and shock, Mr. Hemo, is one of the many things we still don't know about you. Some experts think that in shock, our regulating mechanism breaks down under too heavy a stress. Everybody knows that too big a load will make a mule lie down, or a car clunk out, or a fuse blow. Anyway, shock usually occurs when our body is subjected to a sudden and extremely heavy stress, say from a serious injury, or a severe burn, or even during a major operation. We're pretty sure that in some way, somewhere in the circulating system, a goodly portion of our gallon and a half of hemo gets trapped and stops circulating. You might say the result's the same as if one suddenly lost half of his blood. There's a decrease in blood flow back to the heart. And the heart shrinks, and the blood pressure goes way down. And the critical brain supply gets so low, the brain cells begin to starve, and shortly to die. Millions of people used to die from shock. Today, we save most of them. We may not know the exact cause, but we know a good treatment 
A quick transfusion with emphasis on the quick. A few minutes can mean life or death to the brain cells. That's why helicopters fly the wounded. That's why traffic stops for ambulances. That's why during an operation on a patient whose blood pressure drops too low, he's given a transfusion, adding outside blood to raise the pressure up to where the brain cells can remain alive, giving time for the trapped blood to become untrapped, put back into normal circulation again. These are just a few of the highlights and what little we know of the story of blood and circulation, Mr. Hemo. But the unsolved mysteries are legion. A few examples. What is health? How does the body protect itself as a whole? We don't know. What causes hardening of the arteries? Or high blood pressure? Or anemia? We just don't know. Is each person's blood slightly different from all others? Might be. What is a fever? We don't know that. And this one's got us all scratching. An automobile changes chemical energy into mechanical movement by burning fuel and oxygen in its cylinders. Well, a muscle does this too, but how? In living cylinders? And get this for ignorance. How long is life? How long might a person live if his body cells were untouched by disease? A hundred years? Two hundred? They're all riddles that challenge the spirit of man. And there are hundreds of others. But the men of science will solve them, Brother Hemo. Someday. Sure you will. What better way to love thy neighbor than to heal him? I've got my little set job and my little animal friends have theirs. But we're limited. Man's not limited. Your creation's favorite. You can imagine, reason, dream, create. You know right from wrong. To use these divine gifts is your job. And all nature's waiting to see how you handle it. You're right, brother writer. Research into nature's mysteries could well become the most rewarding and far-reaching of all the arts. One of your greatest physicists, Max Planck, said that over the temple of science should be written the words, ye must have faith. Your great apostle Paul wrote to his new church in Thessalonica, prove all things, hold fast that which is good. A scientist says, have faith. A saint says, prove all things. Together, they spell hope. Dream big. Take a lesson from your heart. The Bell Telephone System takes pride in bringing you this program in its series of shows on science. We acknowledge our gratitude to the distinguished board of advisors covering the broad range of modern science. Biology and genetics, medicine, bacteriology and botany, chemistry, geophysics, physics, anthropology, mathematics, engineering. For the program you have just seen, our thanks to the special advisors who have suggested and checked scientific material. We are indebted to all these men and to many institutions for the generous support they have given this venture in public education through entertainment. <laughs>